All right, buddy. Good, cool morning here up in uh, Central Wisconsin. <laughs> 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 Son of uh, a... Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if you, you got can. Me. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you can hear Mike. He is going to be uh, chewing and eating on a crow, some crow here in a little bit. But it's August 24th, the year 2023. Welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 708. Yeah, 708. And uh, I do want to make a little apology hey, whenever you're ready. Give, give, give you the floor. Oh, right now. Yeah, go well, ahead. Yeah. Let's, let's go. I'm ready for it, man. Like, go yeah, ahead. People talk yeah. about this heat. They they just. Uh, you know, and I, I kind of blamed it on our um, dependence on air conditioning, which mm-hmm. and some level, are. Mm-hmm. go on, some level uh, it works. But I went out for a run. Um, not, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. And uh, boy, it uh, that was probably my roughest run since Ironman Louisville 2014. Oh, yeah, it was one of those, man. <laughs> I was cruising along. I was doing a little, you know, walk run strategy. I'm trying to formulate some things for the race and everything. And I got about, oh, I don't know, three miles in. And, uh, you know, I try to respect the neighbors around here. I don't always go with my shirt off, but I was like, all right, I'll take the shirt off. That usually solves the problem with a little bit of breeze on me. And boy, I got that feeling, man. You know, that Mm -hmm. uh, Louisville feeling when I was just a little bit concerned about myself hot yeah you know well if it was yesterday and i know you said that uh that emily's out there before the cast but her comment in training peaks this morning said might have been the hottest i've ever been on yeah. a run mm-hmm. and that was at 8 40 a.m and yeah it is it's it's straight it's straight nasty and it's like that for not everybody because I, I still read like a couple like cool comments this morning which i'm just like let's just let's just be done with that okay you can circle back next week and remind me how cool it is when we drop down to like you know the 70s again but yeah it's brutal it is mm-hmm. rough it is it is rough and the best thing you can do right now is just uh, be smart with things as i kind of went through that an athlete that lives little north north of me in iowa they're getting the same shit that we are just un i mean I want to say unseasonally, but like even some of the people that have lived here in, in Kansas for 15, 20 years are like, I don't know that I've ever felt that this hot for this like four or five days in a row because it just doesn't get the temp doesn't get low in the, in the evenings. It just stays hot. There's no there's no respite. And yeah, I just said, you know, the strategy is this, you know, if you have a run scheduled, either one run, walk outside. No, no, no questions asked. Run, walk two, treadmill do the treadmill and run straight three, do a bike inside Four, take the day off. But there is nothing good to be gained from going out in some of like these just, I mean, it's oppressive at like six, six AM doesn't, it, there's no escaping it. So you just gotta be really smart with it and, and, and be very, very intelligent with how you handle yourself, how you're feeling, how you're hydrating. So yeah, be safe out there, take care of yourself, uh, especially on these hot runs and it'll benefit you greatly when the weather on race day is, a lot more cool and a lot more uh, favorable. Uh, we'll get rolling today. We have a Q and A, but it's the first time tuning in today. Welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general. As a rabbit, we appreciate you tuning in today. We cover it all. We do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also have a lot of race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about we're going through in life, not just as human beings, but also as coaches and athletes ourselves. Uh, we also talk frequently about what our own athletes are going through. Mike and I work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner level triathletes from the very first 5K or sprint triathlon all the way up through elite level amateurs trying to get back to world championships and everyone in between from all over the globe. And we use the feedback loop we have with them and training peaks, emails, text messages, and the like to drive the discussion of the day. Uh, we also frequently utilize our Facebook group, like we will today, and, and what looks like next Tuesday. Uh, and you can search that "Crushing Iron Group." Answer one simple question, we'll let you write it in. Uh, awesome people, fantastic community, solid resource. Uh, so get in there, be a participant, uh, get good, actionable feedback about things that matter, not you know posts with ninety-five comments about people complaining about what a metal looks like and how devastated they are. Um, you get good stuff in our group. So be a part of it. Don't be a lurker. Participate. And you'll get a lot of good feedback in there. But that's it. No sponsors. No ads. One agenda. That's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Mm. 
And, well, I will, uh, because I think it is an important topic uh, for a lot of people. I do think, though, that I screwed up my pre-rate or, you know, pre-run the day before even. I, I just don't think I'm <laughs> properly hydrated. And then I went for a swim that morning after coffee, you know, kind of that crap. And I think that does matter, though. I, I, it I, does totally matters. You know, um, it really, that's why I feel like it hit me in a weird way. You know, that's kind of what I look for is it's like a lot of times it's hard, but this was a weird heat, like stop. And I tried to get my, I kept walking and trying to get my heart rate down. It just really wouldn't come. And like you said, you man, yeah, you, after a point, that's why you got to be careful in the get go. I think I went out <laughs> a little bit too, uh, spicy, Even not super hot or anything, but like, I just went out maybe a little, you know, cause you kind of sometimes have a tendency to prove something, you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not going to bother me. And then wham. <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> so yeah and it's a it's a it's a topic we discuss a ton especially in in warmer weather races where you know there really is no such thing as cooling yourself off or getting cool or you know cooling down while moving you're just not going to do it if you are moving and your courts are beside there is no cooling you have to like almost be static like just stand there sit on a curb take a minute, douse yourself with water. I mean, there, there's no way around it. So you do, you have to delay that point as long as possible. Because once you get, get there, it's, it's, there's no going back. So mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, the race is coming up. This, this weather will pass for a lot of us and, and we'll be able to have this stuff behind you. Uh, but a few things before we hop into the, the questions of the day. I want to give a, you know, we talk about in our intro how we coach, you know, a wide range of athletes all across the globe. And I want to give a special shout out to Bob Hines, uh, our C26 athlete, who is the oldest athlete at the Ironman 70.3 World Championships at 84. Ah, that's so awesome. Yeah, I woke up this morning, had a picture uh, sent from one of our athletes, Nikki Leo. It was her, Bob, and uh, Emily Ewan, who's in like her early 20s. And, uh, and I just said, that's a lot of generations right there in that photo because mm. <laughs> it really, it really is. It's like one of those family photos where you got like, you know, the granddad, the the mom, and the daughter almost because like that's that's the age range. So it is. It's it's so awesome and so fun to be able to work with such a, again, not just a wide range of abilities, but a wide range of of ages. Yeah, uh, it makes it fun and makes it exciting. And and I just love I love seeing you know people out there in their in their seventies and eighties and you know, basically proven wrong to everybody in their forties and fifties is they're too old to be in shape or too old to get fit again, or too old to be active. Um, they're not, they're just too busy making excuses. So big shout out to Bob. And again, big, uh, big shout out and good luck to everyone racing this weekend in Finland. Uh, there's a lot of racing going on. You got the women and you got the men. Um, no, we'll do too much of a preview on this one, but uh, it should be a pretty pretty interesting day. The women's field looks a lot better than the men's, but it should be fun. A beautiful location, from what I understand, and a lot of fast racing. Uh, so, again, good luck to everybody on that. Uh, without further ado, the first question. I'm kind of skipping down on this one because it, we talked about it a little bit on the last cast, uh, and then we'll go back at the top. We'll work through these, and we'll go through two casts make sure we try and get everybody covered as best we can. Because we do appreciate you guys uh, chiming in and giving questions and stuff. It, it was some of my most favorite podcasts we do with these Q and A's. Um, Michael Tate, if you were installed as the CEO of Iron Man, what would your five year plan look like? <clears throat> oh boy, I assume you I mean, thought about this. Just coming at me cold, so I'll. Uh... I, yeah, I mean, I I, I got you, man. <clears throat> well, I got, uh, I'll have some ideas. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, you got plenty. So. The, and these might sound like the opposite direction, but if I'm if I'm hired as CEO of Iron Man, I am actually constricting the Iron Man race calendar further. I am we're down to nine in North America. I would probably go down to five to seven, and what I would do is I would do two to three year contracts only with ones that are on the fringe. Obviously, you got ones that are. Wisconsin that always they're always you know they've they've got kind of uh, they're grandfathered in but then what I would do is I would throw a lot of money again condense the condense the field right keep growing seventy point three so I'd condense the Ironman races and then what I would do is I would go back and I would throw a lot of money at the uh, the events like the uh, Wildflower the old school race back in, it was like the Woodstock of, of racing back in California. I'd go back to Louisville. I'd go back to some of these iconic races that, that 
you know, and just 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 even like a one year, a one off, because what I think that does is is it gets people excited about doing something new because if people do they, they get tired of the same shit you know guys like you and i we don't have that problem right like we do the same shit over again a lot of people like new things but going back and digging up some of these past kind of iconic races that people just really really miss i think would go a long way into getting maybe some people who are on the shelf off the shelf and ready to get back in the game again um, so that's what I would do to kind of like energize things, get people excited from the Ironman distance, but also shrink it to make sure the races are back to like, you know, 3000, 3500 people really a, just in a totally different experience than what a lot of the races are now. Now what, and by shrinking those, what I would also do if I'm Ironman is I would go and I would find the top five to six, maybe even, you know, seven to 10 best sprint and Olympic distance races in the country. I would pony up and partner with USA Triathlon and I would make these state, you know, because I've already got, you know, state championships, regional championships. And I would require athletes to participate in a certain number of sprints or Olympics before they were allowed to sign up for a 70.3. And then at least two 70.3s before they are required or allowed to do an Ironman. That takes care of the swim time issue. But what it does is, is it one, I think it, it, it grows the sport from the bottom up, right? Not from the bottom down. Uh, and it, it's kind of like, like, you know, um, if you're, if you're Apple, right, you know, you, you maybe you end at the desktop computer, but you start at the earbuds or like if you buy the, you buy the, the big screen, you get everything with it, right? You just shoot Iron Man first. You, you, you sign up, you buy a, you buy a desktop, you get the laptop, you get the iPhone, you get the, you get the Apple watch, you get the AirPods, you get an iPad, you get it all. There's no reason to go back. There's no reason to shop. You got it all at one time, right? And that's that's what you do. That's what a lot of triathletes do, and they sign up for an Iron Man right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. So in order in order to buy the the desktop or to buy the laptop, you got to buy the AirPods first, right? You got to buy a then you got to buy an iPhone. Then once you've had iPhone for a year, then you get an iPad, and then you can work your way up. So in order to get to where you want to go, you got to do a few things, which is to me. The, the the biggest problem with the sport. So I, I would create actually a point, a, a kind of proof of, uh, proof of not athleticism, but proof of you know points, right, from sprints and Olympic distance to get you to where you can center percent point threes. This to me creates a better event and a better possibility. And then I would go back and I would throw in. Uh, this is a discussion you and I had back three years ago. That at select 70.3s and full distance races, we would have an open wave and then in a rolling wave. So, like, you know, right now they have, like, I'm a huge fan of the mass start. Always have been, always will be, and you won't convince me that it's safer because, frankly, it's not. So, you can say it is, but it might make you feel safer, but it's not. It's not. So, what happens is, I mean, you had two athletes down in the swim in Ironman Cork this last weekend, rolling start. Um and so what I would do is I would have select races where right, like right now, if it's wetsuit legal or excuse me, not wetsuit legal, you can start at the back. Okay. And you can not be eligible for it, but you can wear a wetsuit. But what I would do is I would have some select 70.3s and some select, some select, uh, full distance races where you have an open age group to where if you want to be eligible for, for awards, then you all start in a mass start. So maybe let's say it's, you know, there's 2,000 people signed up. Let's say that's 300, 400 people that are interested. Those people are eligible for awards. You have master. Now you know who you're competing with. You know that if someone is next to you, you know you started at the same time. There's no this. I mean, think how ridiculous it is that we have age group athletes cross a finish line and have no clue if they won. They have to sit there and wait. 10, 15, 20 minutes sometimes yeah. to see how they actually did. It it tears away the experience from some of those people. And so I and then you let everyone else do rolling start. Everybody's happy. Right. And more than likely, what you did is you removed the people that you're so scared of swimming over you. Right. Now you're all, you know, more than likely you know some of the same swim speed. I would add those in and those 70.3s get higher points and we only have to do one to get to do an Ironman. And obviously there'd be, you know, you would be able to retro if you've already done one, you can go back in. But this is, I think that's a great way to kind of galvanize the sport from the ground up and get people into it, right? To do it and and then go and do these local races, go and do these sprints. Will that ever happen? No. But if that, if I was Ironman or even for a day, 
that's what I would do. I would try to bring the oldies back. I would condense back down to less events, make them more, you know, uh, harder to get into where you have to sign up. And then in order to get into them, you got to do some of these races. So to support local mom and pop, right? And then you can, um, you know, eventually do the one you want to do. And then you're hopefully in the sport for long enough to where you're going to be in it for a long period of time. And now you become not just an athlete who does an Ironman, now you become an advocate for the sport. Because instead of being in the sport for a one-off and telling maybe two people about it, now you've been in it for three or four years, and now you've told 30, 40, 50 people about it. Your athletes are your best salespeople. So that's that's what I would do. I've got a few more, but I'm sure you got some on the tip of your tongue. Uh, well, not really. I was thinking about that. I mean, this is such a big question. I think that um, when you think about, and we talked about, obviously, that Ironman is a corporation, and, and it's kind of what I would consider, you know, going through the phase of it started with a pure goal in mind and uh, was, a, you know, run by people who probably cared about it, you know, the sport and everything. And then it turned into a corporation at some point, like most do. And then it becomes all about what, you know, I kind of joke about a lot when the, the big, how are you going to scale question? And I think that they face a lot of that in the business. So it's about scaling. It's about swallowing up little fish along the way and just kind of taking them out of your com competitive realm and then it becomes you know just a numbers game for them and they're just moving you know pieces around all the time without focus I think a lot of times on the actual athletes and developing you know the base for it um, it just becomes you can do it and you know and then you get I mean I would love to see their um, DNS list or like how many people just kind of get it in their, in their head to climb Mount Everest or whatever and then decide not to or whatever. And then there's so I assume there's a lot of uh, um, and everything you said is, is perfect in the sense of it, it would help actually develop people who could be long term customers. And what I, I just think a lot of corporations now don't really think about that much, you know, you know, as a longtime baseball fan, I feel like they've been shoving me out for years, you know, just trying to convince, in other words, trying to convince people who aren't even into it to like it and, or, you know, just kind of branching out and just trying to throw a big net all over the place and hope that you can get some people to sign up for your sport rather than building it up. Like you're saying, I mean, working with these little, instead of, you know, buying everybody out, maybe work with some people, help them get strong, build the sport locally and then have it grow, um, regionally. And then, you know, get people actually to the point where they're experienced and seasoned enough to compete Ironman and, and not do it once and just hate it forever, you know, and quit. No, you know, a lot less one and done type of deal. So, and I think that's really how it, you know, spreads word of mouth and getting to know friends and people like that and if you start at the bottom like you're saying I mean I like everything you said there you know just uh get the smaller races involved and somehow make them part of the you know whatever you want to call it the farm system or something and um and just sort of keep building more and more athletes that are actually capable of doing these things because they've gone through the process rather than saying ah you can do it just do it <laughs> go out and you get, it's the worst day of your life and you're like why would I ever want to do that again um so yeah those are the kind of, that's the way I think about it I mean I don't know what the solution is because now you're I don't even know who owns it now um maybe they have people in there that care again but it just seemed like for the longest time you know even it was just weird when we would go to um events and you know we would win the club championship or something and it just didn't even seem like they really cared to me like you know, some people did, but yeah, they, could, they, they, they could go, they could go a long way in there and some of their customer service experience things. I, I'll readily admit that, you know, uh, I mean, with the people and I've always thought like, do what you can have like a race developer or something or assistant and figure out ways to, you know, I always talk about the, how Wisconsin has developed into the, you know, the fan support. And I think that's really mostly organic, but is there ways that Ironman could, think about that and strategize about that. Like maybe have, you know, encourage little festivals in certain towns that you go through and, you know, just to make it more of an event. But like you're saying, involved people who aren't necessarily involved, but work with them instead of trying to, you know, just take them all out along the way. Yeah. Befriend the municipalities along the way. Yeah. I mean, do things that are good. No, um, no, I love, I love all that. And I would also, I would also go back to the one day, 
World Championship. Oh, how much percent right man, now? The, the the two day event, it's been terrible. Just has, and I would rotate it. I would do Kona one year, and then I would do somewhere else, and then somewhere else, and then back to Kona, and just rotate it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm good with that. Cycle of the, you know, the women for try has been a huge flop. If you raced an Ironman the last 12 months as a female, you could have gone to Kona if you finished. That's it. If if you want, if you wanted to go and you could afford it, that's not a world championship. So you've you've actually instead of growing the sport, you've diluted it in in a huge way, in my opinion. And so make it one big spectacle on one big day. Kona's already said we can't. You can't do a two day event here, so you know, go back. That's fine. And then the years you're not there, hold a race. So every third October. Is the Kona Ironman World Championships, and you can go, and it's a one-day event. And yes, will there be more males and females? Yeah, but that's just we we we've we've proven that that's that's just how it's going to roll for a while. So unless things you know dictate change, and that's how it's going to be. And then the other two years, you host the Kona, or you ho- you host you know quote unquote Ironman Hawaii. So anybody that wants to go race the Kona course can go race it and pay a premium, right? And it's much less of a of an um, you know interference with the with the with the city because it's not like a week long event; it's just a regular race, right? That's what I would do, and then rotate, right? Go. To, I think I think having it in Nice is great. I mean, I think changing it around because I think what happens is is like from a professional side and even from the age group side, like. If you don't do well in heat or you don't do well on a certain course, you're never going to get the best out of your ability there. But then you look at a course like Nice, polar opposite. Polar opposite conditions, polar opposite swim, polar opposite bike course, polar opposite run course. I think it's great. And I think if they have done this, you know, the last 20 years, you'd have seen a lot different Ironman world champions. And I think that's great for the sport because it's a should be a global sport. So I, and that's that's the last thing. I was like, go back to the one day. We tried it. I get it. Some people might like it. I'm sure I'll get some hate mail, but just fine. But it's proven that it doesn't work. It doesn't work. They're handing out slots to go to Kona. Do you hear that? They're handing out slots. Mm-hmm. They're emailing people to go to Nice that did a race 12 months ago. Hey, you've been selected because you're you place 39th in your age group. Sure, mm-hmm. if you want to go, go for it. You got the opportunity. Roll with it. But that you're diluting the thing and the experience that that a lot of us got us into the sport. Right? Right. See, age groupers that qualify that had to go and do this. Like it's 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 not a it's not one of those things where you open up the gates and let everyone in. It's okay to not do that. It's perfectly fine. Regardless of what some people, some people might tell you. Um Next topic. Adriana, first time doing an ocean swim for an Olympic in September. What guidance would you give on how to approach uh, swim with waves, current, and swimming out and back? Great question. Um, you know, one, you can't probably predict what the swim will be like. It might have no current. It might have no waves. Uh, and it might be just, you know, pancake flat. You know, it could have some waves, no current. So, you know, a few things that that are different, and you, we've gone over this, you know, at nauseum and a lot of the How to Not Suck a Swimming podcasts or rants that I've done about the difference in swimming and open water swimming is you have to have it. You need to do a cadence check, right? You need to do a, a stroke rate check. How quick is my turnover? Because if you're a person who doesn't have another gear, who doesn't have a quick turnover, you will struggle swimming against a current. Right. You know, we, we watch people in Chattanooga, you know, struggle with, you know, these long strokes and end up going backwards. Right. Because they have no they have no, you know, extra gear. So be prepared to have a strong cadence and have that strong and quick cadence not be one that actually makes you go from zone two to zone five. Right. And you're going anaerobic, but just one where you're picking up the pace a little bit. That's it. You know, and then you need to be what you also need to do is you need to figure out. If there is a current, which way it's going? Is it going left? Is it going right? So if you're staring at the buoy, right, and you see the the current is moving from west to east, so moving to the right, and you're staring at the buoy, you need to go and you need to go to that buoy, then you need to start out way left because you know the current's going to push you towards the buoy, 
right? What you don't ever want to do in a race, regardless of lake or open water or excuse me, or, or ocean is try to swim against a current that's going like kind of side to side. You want to let it take you where you need to go. So if I'm staring at, you know, example, if I'm staring at that buoy and like, cause I, when I used to do Gulf, Gulf coast, 70.3 and I've done Ironman Florida, I'd always kind of look out and see which way the current's going. Right. And then practice that. And and so if I'm staring out that buoy and, and the current's moving to the right, you know, so it's moving west to east, I'm taking, you know, how, depending on how fast it's moving, right. I might walk five yards to the left or 10 yards to the left. And now instead of having to, to, to fight hard to swim a straight line, then, and then maybe I get caught on the inside of the way and I have to fight against the current. All I really do is have to just swim and swim straight and let the current kind of like a golf fade kind of take me to where I want to go. And now I'm not fighting anything. Then you make the corner, right? You turn right. Now you got the current at your back. So if that's the example. And that's what's happening. And you got long and strong strokes, right? And so the current's taking you, Taking, you know, you doing things for you, just like, you know, you talked about Louisville, or Louisville, Chattanooga, California, Augusta, these downstream swims, you know, you get these long and strong shows because the current's doing you a favor. There's no reason to have a higher cadence. You make the corner, now you're heading back in. Well, now that, now that current that was originally, right, so you're doing a clockwise course, now that, that, now that current that was going against you, you know, it's still going to the right, but now it's going east to west. Well, now... You do the opposite. So now when you corner that buoy and you're coming back into shore, you, you're siding off, you know, the finishing chute or a hotel in the background or or some kind of a landmark. Well, now you don't want to aim to the left because the water's pushing you, you know, pushing you um, the other direction. You'll go far left, right? So what you want to do now is take the, the buoy as tight as you possibly can and aim 10 yards inside of, you know, to the right of, where the, of the finishing chute as your landmark is and let the current take you to where you want to go. So there's all these. It's the current is it, to me the current is the is the is the hardest because you're you're working against a constant resistance, east or west, north or south, one way or the other. You're working against something, and you have to play that, and you have to understand what you have to do with it. Waves, you really swim. You just have to be able to time your breathing, right? You never want to. Uh, you have to time your sighting. Do you want to sight at the bottom of a wave? Nope, because you'll be looking into the next wave. <laughs> you want to sight at the top of a wave. If you're going on, you know, you're doing a beach run, you got to learn how to dolphin dive. And you also need to learn that you don't need to, you know, try to, most of you don't need to try and dive over waves, right? I've seen most of your verticals, not very good. You need to go under waves, right? And there's, there's a lot of things that, that can be done to really minimize any kind of, you know, negative experience. And honestly, like, I think that's what makes ocean swims the most fun, you know, is playing with the current and, and understanding waves and how to do this and how to do that. And you can, you can do that all, you know, before you get in the water on the, on the pre-race swim, you know, the day before, two days before, but biggest thing is, is, is be strong, right? You can't be long and smooth and slow. Cause next thing you know, you're 45 yards off course and you're hanging onto a kayak and your day is over. Yeah. Um, I don't have the experience that you do with the uh, ocean part of things, but like when I think about waves, and to me that that's the first thing that comes to mind is sometimes those swells can be weird, and, and you know you're up on a swim, you're swimming, and you're actually just paddling air. Sometimes, I mean, I think sometimes for me the in chop, I like to think of it almost like I like to think of contact in a sense of you just kind of got to you know, just be flexible and roll with it. And I don't know, like I've, I've been in some pretty choppy swims. One of the things I tend to do is just to try and stay in the, like, you know, contacted with the water, if that makes any sense. Because uh, if you get in that weird rhythm, it, it's almost impossible to get out sometimes. So I just have to be really relaxed and, and kind of like you're saying, stay with it and stay, um, get the turnover a little bit higher, but but really just kind of flow through it. I've, I, you know, for me, one in, in a rough swim, sometimes it's the last year I was, I pulled the, my cap over my ears because the water kept slapping, you know, it was just a, the loudness of it. You got to really stay kind of calm in there. And that's really where I go on these kind of things. It's just to not let it get crazy. And cause I've been in that spot where you're just like, you can't find a rhythm at all. And you're, and, and you're not even swimming, really. It's as much as you're floating up and down and trying to get going and stopping and going and stopping and going. So I just try to keep smooth and, and uh, strong in contact with the water. That's excellent advice. 
because uh, it is a lot, a lot of people find themselves doing, you know, kind of the, the two steps left, two steps right to get one step forward. So weird, swimming. man. Yeah, like some, yeah, you, just, you just give up sometimes. It's like, yeah, what? yeah, it's, it, it is. And it, it's, it's, uh, it can be frustrating. So again, just know what you're working with and, and plan accordingly. And if you have to be thoughtful about it, you just do strategic, thoughtful, and aggressive with it. And not just, I'm just going to go out and swim 1.2 or 2.4. A lot of shit can go wrong, but a lot of shit can go right. And you can swim with the same effort and swim honestly 10 seconds slower than somebody but if you take the right lines you know how to use the water and use the current and anticipate waves and and how to you know sight well you'll beat somebody it's 15 seconds faster than you per hundred because again one of the we say this all the time at swim camps and tri camp is it doesn't matter how fast we make you if it's just going to make you go faster and further in the wrong direction we've actually made you go slower <laughs> so you know that's you see that a ton right and uh it's just one of those things you gotta you gotta be thoughtful about Next question from Iram. Tips for easier transition to clipless pedals. Um, I, I don't know that I have much for that. You know, you one, just know that you're going to do the slow motion fall over that we all have done on our bike. You know, you're, you're clipped in, you think you got it all of a sudden you don't, and you don't fall over fast. You fall over in slow motion and you never fall over alone. You always fall over with an audience. Uh, that is just yeah. a fact. So just know you're going to fall over, but two things you can do off the top of mind one, do it on like a greenway or a path, right? Or in a parking lot or a sidewalk that's close, that has like grass on both sides and practice. That way, if you do fall over, you fall over on grass, fall over some soft. Just, just, honestly, just like you would teach or work with your kid on how to ride a bike, give them an, give them an out, right? Give them a, 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 a place where they can kind of fall over and not feel like they're going to absolutely destroy themselves. That, and then the other thing you can do is depending on what kind of pedal you use, if you have, like I've got look pedals, there is a tension, right? There's a tension gauge on it where you can use a very, very, very small Allen wrench to either do plus or do minus. And what this does is it actually um, lets you adjust the float, what they call float with your pedals, right? Where the cleat meets the pedal. It can be either very, very, very easy. Like you can be pedaling on your, in your, in your, you'll unclip on your own because it's so loose or you can have it to where it's so tight that it takes like you have to, you know, tear your MCL just to get your, just to get your, your ankle out of it. <laughs> um, so, so make that as loose as possible and start with that in practice. You know, another good way is to, to put your bike on the trainer. Practice, just practice the quick, practice the quick, practice the quick, um, and, and practice there and then go outside and do it. But you should always, you know, and then, and then obviously when you're on the road, you're coming to a stop sign, you're coming to a stoplight. Don't unclip when you get to the, you know, the, the, the stopping point in the road. You're right. Pre unclip. <laughs> like those people do it all the time. They get right and they're about to come to a dead stop and they're like, I'm going to unclip. If you are coming to a dead stop and slowing down and you unclip, you are more than likely going to go down. If I'm coming up to a stop sign or even sometimes like a green that I think might turn yellow, I immediately unclip and keep pedaling. You can keep pedaling, right? If you clip something, and that way, if I know, I just can I can lay it down whenever I need to lay down, or I can just clip back in and keep on rolling. So you got to just like you anticipate hills, anticipate stopping. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that. I mean, just I'm always cl uh, declipping one side and just cruising up to that stop sign or whatever. But yeah, you're, yeah. it's amazing how many people do that. Everyone it, does it. I think it, they always fall at least once. I've. <laughs> I was out on the Chattanooga course. We were doing a practice ride once with a guy, and he's he'd been doing, you know, he'd been clipping for years, and he came up to us, and you just forget sometimes, I guess. He came up to about eight of us, and we were all kind of side by side. He he forgot, and he fell into me, and we fell all down like dominoes. The whole, <laughs> the whole group. I was like, "What the fuck are you doing right now?" Uh, it happens I don't know. all of us, man. You just got to laugh it off. I mean, I've told a story again, but when I was living at Hilton Head, this is two thousand and. Three, I was actually about to do my very first triathlon on the beach, the Beach Bum Triathlon, and I was riding home on my S22 felt tri bike that I'd only ridden outside in like twice. And I was riding home from the office into the condo on the beach, and uh, I pull, I pulled. There's like if you've been to Hilton Head, they got this you know uh, it's basically just like one long road on the beach with all the hotels and condos and stuff, and then they've got this long path that just runs you know parallel to the road, and. I came over to this light where I had to stop and I looked over and there was these very attractive females and I was kind of feeling myself and I just forgot to feel myself enough to unclip and slowly did the fallover right in front, right in front of these ladies. 
Uh, and it happens. It just happens. I mean, it's, but it's always going to be in front of someone. So just, just know that in your room. Next question. Danny Balo, 650s hard and then four. And excuse me. The question is 650s hard. Talking about swimming here. Then three 400s. Then another 650s hard. Should I strive for my second set of 50s to be near or same the speed as the first set of 50s? Thank you. Um, you know, I would say, I would say no. I mean, the, you know, when you, when you talk about 50s and you talk about going hard, right, you never want to, a lot of people make the mistake of going out way too hard and way too fast. And then they might, let's see if you got 20 50s, they, they burn their biscuits in the first four. And then all they're doing the next 16 is just really, really having really, really shitty form. So what I would do if I was attacking that is I would take, if I see the whole set and I've got 650s hard, then, then three 400s and another 650s hard, what I would say is, all right, what, you know, what's my best average likely going to be? I'm going to go out and let's say my best average is going to be, you know, like 36 or, or 37 on these. You know, and it's also very dependent on what the rest is. So I could definitely use a little more intel on this, but I, I get your, I get your, uh, your question is then I would probably aim for, you know, a range. So let's say again, let's say my goal is to hold 36, 38, then I would probably go out the first 650s and be able to hold 36s, right? So And then, but it wouldn't feel, it would feel hard, but it wouldn't feel all out. And then I take my break, I do the three 400s are probably zone two, zone three. So I'm getting a little bit of, I'm working out the lactic acid. I'm probably getting a little bit of endurance and I'm catching my breath. My arms are, you know, probably going to loosen up a little bit. And then I got my last 650s hard. Well, now I am know I'm probably not going to do 36s, but now I have to kind of aim for 38s while having picked up the effort level to hold it, right? So it's, it's, it's much like negative splitting, right? And the same thing goes for, you know, if you get bike intervals or run intervals where you've got, you know, three times four, three times six, three times eight, you want them to be pretty close to the same, right? Pace, effort, heart rate, everything. You just know that the last interval is going to take a lot more out of you, right? Especially if they're they're really really hard, really really difficult, you don't want to see a huge drop. You want to either fight to keep it the same, or start out with a gradual build, right? So you're because the you get you do you you get a lot of people think that the slower you get, the less adaptation you get, but that's actually not true. Is if you have to really pick up the pace and pick up the effort to hold a 38, and your arms are fatigued, your legs are fatigued, your heart rate's already high. Then you're getting, you know, you're you're creating this resistance to fatigue by forcing yourself to go faster, and your body adapts to that. And so you, there's really no wrong way to go about it. I mean, obviously the well, there is. The only wrong way would be to like the for those 1250s, you know, you have a range of you know 36 to 38. You go all out in the first, and you were 33, 34. And now you're smoked, and now you're doing you know 33, 34, 37, 37, 38, 39. Take your break. Now you're gassed for the three 400s, and your arms are smoked. 41. 42, 43, and you end up not feeling good and your form sucks. So, you know, again, it's it's hard to screw up, but that is the one way you can probably screw it up. You know, I had an interesting thought when you're saying that about negative splitting and thinking about it in terms of negative splitting the effort, which mm. um, I don't necessarily think about personally, and I don't know if a lot of people do, but I mean, when you, if there's a warm up there, which I assume there is, and then you go into your fifties and you're, you're going, I always try to think of it in terms of like, all right, well, I'll probably actually start feeling better after I do these 400s, you know? So I'm not gonna, I'm not good, but, uh, but I think a lot of people do that. And I think it's a valuable skill to learn to kind of go out a little bit harder than you should, and then figure out how you're going to get back to baseline or at least, you know, regroup and, and that's kind of part of things too. And I've talked about that before. And uh, as far as thinking about this Ironman I'm doing is a lot of times I just feel good in the first half of the marathon. And, and a lot of times that really kind of gets my average speed down a little bit. And I think I'm almost better sometimes at holding on. So is it a hold on or is it, are you getting stronger? You know, and I think both those skills are valuable. So, and, and to me, that's about negative splitting effort. And I've never really kind of thought about it that way. To be honest, I've always just thought about it as setting up my negative split in the first half, mm. but, but sometimes yeah. you can burn it. And then how are you going to regroup and get back to it? Cause that does happen often in racing. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I know that, you and I both use, I've got quite a few swim structured workouts where the goal is to eat, whether it's short or fast, like, you know, as short as a 50, I'll do, you know, swim 35 yards all out. 
and then 15 yards settle in, you know, a real short one, you know, but it does, it teaches you how to gather yourself, right? That's, that's kind of like step one, the, the smallest dose. And then I got, then it works all the way up to, you know, what I call like, you know, one of your, one of the 70.3 and, and Ironman final, what I call kind of like race ready or race prep sessions includes 400 where you do 200 to 250 all out zone three zone four and then the next 200 you just settle in and so you're practicing what it feels like to race whether you like it or not you're going to start fast either because you're you're jacked or you think you're faster than you are or you want to swim around people or you're anxious but you're going to go out faster and this teaches you how to you know relax and you know it's it's very similar to you know what cycling or even running they'll do with over under so you do uh, you know, under threshold over threshold, under threshold. It's really about lactate shuttling. This is a way for swimming to do that and to teach your body how to do that so you don't immediately start producing lactate out of the gate and then all of a sudden your race is screwed. So there's a lot of ways to uh, to mitigate the the you know negatives that would come from you know swimming a lot and not being able to not just from a, a physiological standpoint but also from a mental and emotional place right to to know that you can go out to go all out right now in the pool but to go all out in like the open water and then gather yourself and be good not have to you know do backstroke or breaststroke or hang on to a kayak but gather yourself while moving because that's key um jeff lawn get off i'm gonna start calling you jeff get off my lawn is there ever a time to increase watts on a 70.3 or 140.6 bike for example let's say you are 35 miles in to a 70.3, and your target is 200. You're at an AP and NP of 200, and your heart rate is 125. Should you continue at that current target or, say, bump it up to 205? Maybe the target watts were too low, but it's having a great day, or even it's 75 degrees. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I'd say for a 70.3, I tend to give the green light after mile 40 because then – the weather has changed, right? So maybe you get on the bike and it's 55, but by mile 40, it's probably 70. And you know what it's going to be, right? So again, it's not about, you know, a lot of people think about what's the weather like now. It's also about what is the weather going to be like when it matters most, which is on the run, right? High dew point, high humidity, high heat. When's it going to happen? How am I going to be affected? And yeah, can you raise the watts? Sure. Like you always get the, I get the green light at mile 40 and then a mile 80, 85 on, on the, on Ironman. Ironman, most people are out there for, you know, four to five and a half hours. Most people aren't thinking about raising the watts. <laughs> They're thinking about conserving energy because this isn't a time trial. You have to bike or excuse me, you have to finish your bike and then you have to go run. So the question I always have athletes ask themselves, and again, you should, that's why knowing yourself and knowing your body and knowing your effort level is knowing when you got it, knowing when you don't, because if you got it, then let it fly, baby. Don't overthink and don't hold yourself to 200. Let it roll. But having said that, the one thing you should always do is ask yourself this question before you make any decision. Is this going to help me or hurt me the last half of the run? And if the answer is, I'm not sure, then don't do it. Mm. If the answer is, hurt me, definitely don't do it. Um, because, listen, it's all about energy, right? It's all about energy expenditure. So, yes, you might be able to pick up, you know, like going back to, you know, the swimming example, one of the one of the things I like to do a lot with athletes is do like, you know, three, um, you know, 325s, 350s, 300s, easy, one hard. And I do that to still get in some hard work and keep things crisp. But what I also do is I liked it because you show the athlete what the effort level required is to even just increase four to five seconds per hundred. And then if you, you know, and then if you calculate that out through a, a mile or 1.2 or 2.4, you're like, All right, so I can swim really, really hard and go really anaerobic and it'll suck and burn. And I'm going to say, and I'm going to, but I'm going to make up. Two minutes and 10 seconds. <laughs> you're like, that's not worth it. Cause you're probably going to lose it in transition as you walk to your bike and take your sweet ass time in transition because you're gassed. And now you may have even lost time. Same thing on the bike, right? You know, bumping it from 200 to 205, you're in the, at the last 16 miles, you're not even going to gain a minute probably. So is that worth it? I'm going to say no. All right. It takes like significant is like, you know, going from 200 to 220, 160 to 180. 
you know, even like 160 and 167, like you, you're, you, it's not going to, it's going to be negligible. So you just have to know your body and also know the course and know the day. Um, but, you know, again, and we said this before, I've, I've never met an athlete who's finished a race and they've been like, man, I blew it. All 40 of the bike should have crushed it, but didn't. And I had just a lot, I had a lot left in me because listen, it's about the last 5k of the 70.3 run course. And it's about the last 10k of the run. That's where you either pass 50 people or bleed time. So ask those selves your question, ask yourself those questions before you make decisions. Uh, excellent advice, my friend. Thank um, you. Yeah. You know, I think the, the the thing about that on the bike is that, you know, it, it all, it's so much dependent on the course and all these kind of things too. It's like, if you're, if you got a really favorable ending to your, your ride course, um, and it's, you know, nice grades and things like that, you know, and as you know, I don't, um, use Watts a lot, but my, my thought about that compared to effort is like, are you getting enough out of your speed sections or, you know, things like that, that you can, you know, cause if you got a lot of Hills and you got, you almost got to watch yourself or you're going to go over that easily. So, um, to me, it's more about like just riding free and riding well and taking corners and, you know, just like you said, you know, stay in arrow and save, you know, save some energy and just cruise a little bit more, whatever, you know, because you're saying it is about the run, but I think a lot of times people can, um, I can be careful about this, not get as much out of their bike as they think they can, or they, you know, they're just yeah. a little bit concerned about it because, you know, it's like, I, I just think that I'm always amazed at, um, how much in race recovery I can go through. And we talk about, you don't trust how you feel right now because it's going to change, especially on a full, you might feel like you're done. And then like 20 minutes later, you're like, man, I'm back, you know? So mm -hmm. there's all those things you got to pay attention to. And I just think sometimes we're, uh, you know, I don't want to say too cautious on the bike, but I think sometimes, I mean, for me, it's almost like running. Sometimes going slower is a little bit harder. So if you're like kind of forcing yourself to be slow, but you feel really good, sometimes I think that can take a little bit out of you, to be honest. Well, listen, I, I think most people would be better off, again, and you see this all the time, especially on hilly technical courses, they freeze up and clam up on the corners and the turns and the ascents where they could be just rolling free and making up time and then feel like they have to hammer it coming out of it or going downhill or going uphill and they getting zero return or negative return. All this energy, all this extra effort for negative return or know how to handle your bike, know how to take a corner, know how to descend, gain time, free effort. Yeah. Seems pretty easy. Next question. Elise. <laughs> Elise Galagos. Will you ever... Zwift race against me. Um, we posted this on whatever was it last Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. Uh, and I have, and I have since accepted the challenge. Uh, if you are, you're probably not, well, if you're familiar with Elise, Elise and our, you and I, and, and or with Mike and I go way, way back. Uh, she was an athlete that I've coached in the past, coached 10, 11, 12 years ago. Um, and is a insane athlete, uh, has won Ironman Florida as the age group champion before, been to Kona, been on the podium at Kona, quintessential, amazing athlete, amazing mom of two, crushes it. And I think now she's doing like a Zwift racing league. Like she's been like recruited. She's that good, which I knew she was good before I accepted the challenge, but then she showed me numbers and now I feel like I should, should bail, but I'm not. So the week of November 13th, we're going to take on, I'm going to race her in a Zwift course. Then we're going to race, I threw in the 50 free, because I feel like I can get her on a clipper on the 50 free. And then we're going to do a one mile race. Spread out through a week and just see who wins. Now, the, the caveat here is, the loser has to wear a Lionel Sanders No Limits headband and t-shirt and shoot a two minute video of why the other person is greater. <laughs> which would pain me to all levels. Um, <laughs> one, to purchase No Limits Lionel Sanders gear, uh, but then to have to do that. But yeah, I've, I've accepted the challenge. So uh, that, that week we will, uh, yeah, well, I told her, I said, really my game plan is to not bike at all. 
because you're going to smoke me. My game plan is to run and swim and, and hopefully clip you on both of those and take home the victory. Because <laughs> I don't think there's any way possible I can't even get close from the bike because she is just an absolute animal. But we'll see. Should be fun. But yeah, so in November, I'll race, uh, I'll race her and we'll see how much I get destroyed. Wow. Well, uh, I accept the challenge too oh. and but i'll just make the video right now <laughs> I'll, right. <laughs> I'll put the headband on and just tell her everybody why she's such a beast and better than me yeah she is uh she's insane insane yeah. athlete great person uh next question renee how was summer doing i saw her post in my mind she's hanging in there she'll appreciate you asking we'll make sure we let her know but she is uh she's hanging in she's still taking some time away from from work which we uh heavily encouraged to take all the time that they need uh, and they're very appreciative. But yeah, they're, uh, I think they're hanging in there. So that's uh, a very kind of you to, uh, very kind of you to ask. Um, Lisa Prawn, considering running a spring marathon. In the past, when I trained, I was able to run at least five times a week and my body cooperated. Now, as I creep up into my mid 50s, I'm hoping to be able to mix up my approach a little bit. Thoughts about using the bike for some of my hard efforts. Is it possible that I can run four times a week? with the majority of those being easy paced also can a little bit of swimming be integrated in there hoping for a little bit of guidance thanks so much yeah it's it's an excellent question um and one that you know you and i have a ton of experience with with the athletes we work with we've got athletes that you know like to like to weave in marathons or half marathons you know throughout the year whether they're approved or unapproved uh, they'll weave them in anyway uh regardless of whether you're on the calendar um, you know, there's, there's a, a couple of different ways to do this. And the, the answer is yes. Yes, you can do hard work on the bike, but then again, you know, you could, there's two ways to go about it. In my opinion, one, you do your three to four runs a week, you do your long run, you mix in some intervals and the other day of the week, you maybe do tempo, but you add rides in to do extra aerobic volume. That's no impact. Cause the, the thing about running, right. Is that you can't, we could call it easy run. We can call it recovery run. And it might be, you might be reflected on that being that it's, you know, lower heart rate or easier pace. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's still of all the, of the three sports we do or between running and cycling, it is the most impactful on the body. So there really is no, you know, way to go out and do, you know, you'll do an easy run. Um, but there's still going to be an impact, right? And the load on the body, right? And you need that. So you could you do one of two ways, and and, that, and I think the one of them is you you strictly pick if you're very very injury prone for whatever reason you either overrun you run too fast you run too often you've had a lot of injuries or you have bad run form is is if if you if that's you and you're you know then I would do three to four runs easy 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 a week and then do maybe one hard bike session then one complimentary session but I would I would do like big gear work to kind of strengthen that load the other way to go about it. And the way most people should go about it is, you know, three to four runs a week, you know, long run with some intervals or some tempo. And then same thing with like, you know, a midweek run and add in hills maybe as your interval works. So again, easier on the, on the bones cause you're going uphill, but it still gets like the strength and the anaerobic, uh, anaerobic, um, effort. And then add in one to two bikes or even a swim a week. And that be your extra aerobic work. Right, you still need the aerobic work. You still need the aerobic volume. So you're getting that. You're not getting the pounding, but you're having that when you run. So again, like if you're you're running a lot and biking hard, you're doing hard and hard and hard and hard in your body. Right, we all know the impact or the difference that we feel from the the, the waist down when we go run easy. We run hard. You're still gonna be sore, but even on an easy run, you're still gonna be a little achy. Maybe you know, on easy bike, you probably come off feeling a lot. If you might come off feeling fresh than when you started. Mm -hmm. it's, impact right but if you hammer yourself on the bike then you're gonna wake up tomorrow sore to go out and do your easy run that's still hard on your body so that's two different ways to go about it and then the way you structure it though is is the most important and then that's obviously very very specific but yeah it can definitely be done i mean and i would add in swimming in there you know as another aerobic you know thing to do but again how are you doing your swim are you going out and doing you know, 2,500, 3,000 where you're swimming the whole time, you know, you're, well, you're still getting work, right? If, especially if you kick a lot and you're probably gonna be more so the next day, you know, then I would, I would throw the pool buoy and just make another active recovery, flush things out, then do it again. So there's, there's a lot of ways you can, you can do that. One of the things I'll share the, this experience and how I thought it went is, uh, after Wisconsin, there was, there's a, I've, 
for fulls this year, I've almost kind of like totally revamped how I've approached things with the with regards to the run and cycling. And I, I've done some kind of some some back to back run cycling stuff. Um, not what I would consider a brick because the point, but it's actually run first, bike second. Um, and so I'll let you guys know how that works in uh, September uh, for the people that had it. So there, I think there's a lot of things, a lot of ways to be creative. Biggest thing is to stay healthy. And for for a marathon, I mean, that's it. If you can be the, if you can go to start line healthy and you got decent weather, you got a good chance. But that's that's how I would kind of go about things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I <clears throat> I totally agree with that. I I I think four or five days a week running, and I think if you're still, you know, if you want to be a triathlete and, you're, and it's still in your game plan, you know, it's good to keep a swim and a and a ride around. But I think you know a lot of times cycling can crush you, you know, if you go too hard. And I think if your game plan is around a marathon, you know, it should be the main focus, but um, for me, like an easy recovery ride, um, for the, the thing I think about a lot is like, it, it strengthens if you're working on the, you know, the full stroke and, and pulling up and, and getting in that groove. I mean, it's good for your hip flexors. I find that running, you know, that, that, um, we can get lazy out there. And if you can get used to kind of pulling up without the same kind of impact of running, that's a good thing. And also the swim, and we talked about it many times, but it helps develop your core and your core is really important in uh, running. So keep them all going. I, I definitely like you, I, I don't really recommend the hard bikes. I think they help your running if you're doing triathlon, but I think if you're running a marathon, you know, you should probably focus the, the tougher stuff in your runs. That's just my opinion. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Uh, next question. Our last one for today. We'll get the rest of these, uh, Next week, ah, this is kind of on the the topic. Uh, Matt Kolb, can the angle of the seat cause tightness in the hips during the run? I recently raised the nose of my seat up to a more level position and feel that my hips are now more tight when I first start to run off the bike. 100%. If that is the first question I ask an athlete, and, and again, I think it should be stated as well that the angling of your seat is not the only way to create a bad hip angle, right? Like a, a lot of saddles, like into the ISM saddles, they actually ask and you know, they want you for comfort to actually point the nose a little bit up. Then you see people with like totally slanted down and people have it level, but you can also just simply, uh, you know, the, the most common way to adjust hip angle is by, you know, raising or lowering your, your height, your, your, your seat post. Um, you know, way back in the day, you'd see people with these just like insanely tilted in the nose, like almost like pointing towards the bottom bracket because it allowed their hip angle to be a certain way. But what happens is, especially for, you know, for a TT, that might be fine. But for a race, it, what it does, is it puts so much effort on your quads, not just from an effort standpoint, but from a stabilizer, right? You're not, mm. you're not only using your quads as, as energy and as effort and as power, but you're also using it to stabilize your body on the bike, just like having the correct setup in your cockpit, right? Your aero bars, you want to have your, your skeletal system, right? Your, your shoulders, your arms, everything sitting and resting on the pads, Right. Not where your elbows are way too close in and restricting, you know, breathing or not way too far in front of you to where your triceps and your your deltoids are actually, you know, taking the brunt of because those fatigue muscles fatigue bones don't. So it's very, very similar. Um, And so I one of the first questions I ask athletes if they say they have tight, you know, hips, you know, or tight hips or, you know, um, they they can feel it when they run is the first thing I say is, is what's your what's your hip angle like on the bike? You could be sitting too far back, right? Or you could be sitting too far forward. The more closed your hip angle, the more problematic things can become. And yes, you won't really feel it on the bike because you're not moving. But as soon as you kind of stand up to kind of stretch it out, then you immediately feel it. So yes, you can. I would go get a you know get a reputable bike fit and make sure you know you have um, you know the angles. Because listen, people people mess with their seat angle their seat height, the fore and aft, all the time. Comfort, trying to get more power, you know, whatever it might be. And it all affects everything else. And the tighter your hip angle, the the usually the more the more problematic it's going to be for your run. You might be more aero, right? But 
it might absolutely destroy you on the run. And so, yeah, if you're feeling like, you know, niggles in your hip, mostly like, you know, on the interior portion of it, like, you know, people say, that's kind of, it's almost kind of like my groin. It's not, um, it's more of your hip flexors. So if your hip flexors feel really, really tight, you know, yes. Could you need to strengthen those? Sure. But more than likely it's, it's because you, your hip angle is way too closed. And so that's something you have to address. Yeah, I agree with that. Agree with it. Dump. <laughs> Dust it on the hips, baby. Yeah. Well, she's up. We got a lot. We got a lot of really good questions uh, that we'll, we will get to next Tuesday. So as always, we love you guys. We appreciate you. We appreciate the input. We appreciate the topics. A lot of good ones in here. Um, so we'll get to as many of those as we can on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Enjoy yourself. Race hard. Race fast. Put a lot of effort in. Uh, do the best you can. Uh, and if you're, if you got the same heat going, be super smart with it and just realize that, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot more training left to do. Hydrate, hydrate before, hydrate during, hydrate after, take breaks, do it in the shade, do it early, do it late, do what you can. Uh, and as always, go to our website, c26triathlon.com. It is our one-stop shop for all things coaching camps and community. If you need anything from Mike, he is available, crushingiron at gmail.com. Or if you need anything from me, c26coach at gmail.com. All right, my man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, see you, buddy. Yeah.